Folks, in the next few months, our Sunday evening lessons are going to be based upon the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is probably probably one of the most profound, famous, and admired messages given by Christ that you find in the New Testament. The authority of the preacher is absolute. Folks, would you, wouldn't it be awesome to get to hear Jesus speak, to get to hear one of his lessons? Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. This lesson, folks, is filled with authority. Jesus is authority. The moral lessons and their applications to our lives can make us mature. They can make us complete. The Bible says they can make us perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Therefore you shall be perfect. We know that means complete. You'll be complete as an individual just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Folks, we apply these things into our lives. We obey these things. We will be mature Christians, mature individuals. But the instructions are also highly practical, and they're meant for us to obey. I cannot help but when I read these scriptures to think of the song. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, whoever hears this sermon and obeys it, because that's the most important part, his next statement, and does them. Those that obey, I will liken to him as a wise man that built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, the floods came up, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who hears these sayings of mine, a, a, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And if you ask any of the young people, it was a big splash. It was great was the fall. Folks, we need to listen to the messages, and we must apply them into our hearts and into our lives. And reward for doing such, Jesus tells us in the sermon as well. The reward is entrance into the kingdom of heaven, which we can have both now as well as for all eternity. Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. And he's talking about the here and now. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right now. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking about the things that are taking place right here, right now. We can be a part of the kingdom of God now. But it also relates to that eternal kingdom in heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, that future day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, Jesus is wanting us to look at ourselves. He's wanting us to examine ourselves. He wanted the Jews in their day to do so, and he wants us to do the same today. He presented this lesson most likely during the first year of his preaching on that tour that he went through in Galilee. Most likely, again, this was within that first year of his ministry. There's some scholars that suggest the Sermon on the Mount is like a, a, a collage, a collage of different messages or different lessons that Matthew brings together and says, here is what Jesus taught. And that could be so. 
I would suggest that the message that Jesus presented in that first year of his ministry, wherever he went, would have very, been very similar, been very closely the same. This particular sermon would indeed have been an excellent example of, of the many lessons that Jesus would have presented as he traveled through Galilee. It is detailed, however, it is detailed, but it's also very simple to look at and listen to and understand. Plus, its message is something that everyone during Jesus' day and our day today need to hear and apply into our lives. It's very practical. Jesus, his fame, his fame had already spread throughout the region. And all the way into Palestine, throughout Palestine, people were coming to hear what he had to say. People were coming to hear or coming to see the miracles and maybe even have a miracle done to them. Huge crowds came around him from many different areas. In chapter 4 of Matthew, in verses 23 through 25, it says, And when Jesus went out about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people, then his fame went throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitude, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. There are huge crowds of people following Jesus. Some scholars suggest that Jesus might have first preached a shorter message to the larger of the crowd, did that down, and we'll look in just a minute. Luke's account relates that he stood on level ground and spoke to the multitudes in Luke's account of, the, of this. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 and through 19. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and healed them all. So possibly he's speaking uh, this message to this huge group. But then we see Matthew says that he ascended up on that mountain. And maybe this is a time when he spoke a similar, maybe, maybe more detail to just those that were his intimate followers. Matthew chapter 4, start in verse 25 and then go on into chapter 5. Remember in the original manuscripts and original language, there no, were no chapter, di chapter divisions. So this, don't lose that thought there. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis and Jerusalem, Judea and beyond the Jordan, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. That we might see two different things going on here. Possibly a lesson to the great numbers and probably a lesson to just his immediate disciples. Sermon on the Mount can be put in a simple outline, interesting outline. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, we see the Beatitudes. We see in, in verses 13 through 16 how that we need to be a godly influence to this world. Verses 17 through 20, Christ's relationship with the Old Testament law. And then chapter 5, verses 21 through 48, we see where Jesus is trying to correct people's hearts. He talks about here, and he spoke about murder and hate. He talked about adultery and divorce. He talked about keeping your word, retaliation, and going the extra mile. And he also talked about godly love. He's asking us to correct our hearts. And then in, in chapter 6, he talks about our relationship with God. His message concerned do, doing good to please God, not yourselves or others. He, he talked about how to pray, how to fast, 
tr- laying your treasures up in heaven. He talked about how the lamp of the body being our eyes so we, and serving God, not riches, and also not to worry, but to trust in God each and every day of our lives. And then chapter 7, he talks about our relationship with others. Jesus taught not to be hypocritical judges. He taught us to ask and to seek and to knock. He talked about the broad way versus the narrow way. He talked about recognizing others by their fruits and not everyone is going to obey deity. And he talked about how that we have to build upon Christ. That's our outline of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. And folks, I encourage you as we study this, this, this awesome lesson, this amazing sermon in the next several weeks and months, I encourage you to come and be a part of these lessons. Challenge yourself to truly look into them and apply these things into your, into your hearts and into your lives. Our procedure in the next few months is going to be very similar to what we are doing and what we do during the summer on Wednesday nights. We're going to have several individuals come and present lessons that come from the Sermon on the Mount. The elders asked me to design and develop different gentlemen to come and present these lessons to us. Mark Porter will be starting next week with the first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn, and blessed are the meek. So again, I hope that you will be diligent to come and study from God's Word and be encouraged and apply these godly principles into your minds, into your hearts, and into your actions. But my job this evening is to notice how blessed our lives will be when we follow the Lord's message, when when we follow what He has asked us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's get started this evening. Matthew's account, his gospel account is written to persuade the Jews that Jesus is the one that is going to fulfill the Old Testament law. That he's the one that all those prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah coming into the world, he's the one. He is the individual. Moses was the deliverer of the Jews, uh, the deliverer of the Jews from from bondage, from slavery in Egypt. To prove that God was with Moses and that God established him to be that deliverer, to be the one to bring the people into freedom, God gave Moses the ability to perform miracles and do some amazing things. You remember what all Moses did, starting with the ten plagues. Now God's doing it, but he's doing it through Moses, those ten plagues that went up on Egypt. Through Moses, God parted the Red Sea so that Israel could cross. Through Moses, he provided food and water while the Israelites were in the wilderness and led them to the promised land. Through Moses, God gave the people a law. He gave them a covenant in which they were to live their lives by. Yet Moses proclaimed. He proclaimed there is another prophet coming that was going to be greater than him. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all that you desire of the Lord, your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let, not, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let us see this great fire any, any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what have they spoken is good. What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I've commanded him. And it shall be that whoever will hear, not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require of him. See, Matthew is demonstrating the likeness of Christ with Moses. Moses said, there's going to be another one come that is like me. Well, Matthew shows us how Jesus was like Moses. Just as 
there was the killing of the infants during Moses' time. And we remember the story of how Pharaoh was going to kill all the, ch all the males. That took place during Jesus' time. And just as Moses was taken care of and survived, so does Jesus. Jesus had to leave his homeland. Yet he would be called back to lead his people out of bondage, just as Moses was called by God to return from Egypt and lead the people out of Egyptian bondage. Moses went through the trials. He went through the temptations in the wilderness. And, and Matthew tells us of the trials, the temptations that Jesus went through in the wilderness. Moses went up onto the mountain to receive and deliver the law to God's people. And Matthew relates that Jesus went up on the mountain to present his message to the people on the Sermon on the Mount. Indeed, Matthew is demonstrating that Jesus again is the prophet of which Moses spoke. He's demonstrating that he is the one in whom we are to listen to. He's the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament. So as we look at this sermon this evening, let's remember that it fits within the context of what Jesus' mission, what his mission is. Jesus went throughout the land, chapter 4, verse 23, preaching of the kingdom. And, and to prepare for the kingdom by repenting for the kingdom of heaven was what? At hand, chapter 4, verse 17. To move the people to righteousness. To help move them along, Jesus first had to teach them that they had fallen short of God's glory. In general, the people of Israel had gone through the years and they had changed things about God's law, uh, the Old Testament law directives. They were following more of their traditional laws. We talked about that again this morning in our Bible class here in the auditorium. But the, the the leaders particularly were following or at least telling the, everyone else that they had to follow those traditional laws that they developed if they were going to be pure in the eyes of God. So from their traditional laws, they developed the idea of having like a check-off sheet. You, you had this law, well, I did that. And you had this law, well, I did that. And I'm following and checking off all these laws, all these traditional laws, and in their minds they've checked off everything that God wanted them to do. Their motives were not based from their hearts. They were based on this check-off list that the Pharisees were telling them to follow. Paul related to the Roman Christians that it is with the heart that one believes unto righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. He also related to the Ephesians that we must do the will of God from our hearts. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. So Jesus' desire was to prepare the people and prepare us for the kingdom by affecting their hearts, affecting our hearts, and therefore they would see their need to repent. And he starts with the Beatitudes. He starts with the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 2 through 12. And he begins with the, the Beatitudes, folks. And this was almost like one of those things to jar the people, to jar their thinking, to, and to jar our thinking from our complacency, from our comfort, to investigating our hearts, looking at ourselves, and asking ourselves the question, am I truly in the kingdom of God? Am I really doing what God would have me to do so I can be in the kingdom? If the traits that Jesus described do not parallel with our heart, if they do not parallel with our life, then I'm, I'm not going to be a part of his kingdom. In the next few weeks as we study, I ask you to truly compare yourself with the Beatitudes. Look at your life, and do I have a heart that is poor in spirit? Do I have a heart that is mournful, particularly over maybe the wrong things that I have done? Do I have a heart that is meek, 
filled with gentleness? Do I have a heart that is hungry and it thirsts for righteousness? Do I have a heart that's merciful? Do I have a heart that is pure? Do I have a heart that wants to promote peace? A heart that is a peacemaker. And do I have a heart that's willing to go through persecution? That will be persecuted for doing what is right. Verse 12 says, if these traits are what make up our hearts, if this is what we are, then rejoice and be exceedingly glad. However, if these traits are not what your heart is, then wake up. Wake up and recognize your need in allowing the Lord's Sermon on the Mount to help you identify your shortcomings and see your need to repent. So we see the conflict. We see the conflict that the Sermon on the Mount presents, but we also see the blessings. We see the blessing of life. The first word out of Jesus' mouth with the Sermon on the Mount is the word blessed. If you went and did a word study, and we've done these word studies before, but if you went and did a word study of the original word, you can open up Strong's Concordance, and he defines the original word as meaning happy. That's nice, folks. We'll be happy if we have these traits in our lives. And folks, that's 100% true. We'll find happiness. If your heart is right with God, then you will be cheerful. And your life now and, and for all eternity will be filled with happiness. Yet there is a sense in which this word has a more deeper meaning. Has more of an understanding from a biblical perspective. When we see someone being blessed, let's go back and look in the Old Testament. And we see several times where the Bible says, I will bless you, God talking. We see it with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapters, chapter 1, verse 22, as well as in verse 28. God says to Adam and Eve, I bless you, blessed are you. Does this mean they were happy? Sure, it most certainly does mean that. Yet there's something more. God is bestowing his love to them. God is bestowing his mercy to them. God has favor with them. That is the concept of God saying, blessed are you, is that you have favor in my eyes. So according to the scriptures, God blessed Abraham, he blessed Isaac, he blessed Jacob. This meant that, that they were the privileged recipients of God's divine favor. To be blessed by God is much more than just being happy. Being blessed by God is that God is delighted with us. God is in favor of what we're doing and what's in our hearts. See, God favors us. Therefore, when we open up the Sermon on the Mount, we see deity is expressing their favor, their delight upon those because we have our hearts filled with these awesome traits. We have our hearts and our, our lives following the very things that God would have us to fulfill and do. Yet notice that God's blessings, His favor, is again in this present age. Verses 3 and 10 of the, uh, in chapter 5, enlisting those Beatitudes. He says in those two verses, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Folks, that's present tense. God is saying, I, I will be blessed. You will be blessed by God in your lifetime right now, present tense, God has favor for me right now. His love is there. His mercy is there. His grace is for me because my heart is right with him. But then we also see that his favor will be for us in the future. Verses 4 through 9 relate 
for they shall. For they shall. Future tense. The favor of God, folks, will also be in our future if indeed we're following these beatitudes, if we're following these traits, these practical traits that he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount. Folks, we can have the fulfillment of his blessing now and we can have the fulfillment, greater fulfillment of his blessings later. We ought to be happy. We ought to be happy no matter what happens on this earth, whether the persecutions, the trials, the temptations, because I know I'm favored in the eyes of God. I am blessed by God today and will be highly favored forever by having my heart filled with these beatitudes. See, Matthew helps us to understand that the new Moses has arrived. The greater Moses has come to deliver us from this wicked world. Jesus is the chosen one of God. He is indeed our Savior. John the Baptist, when he was imprisoned, he was the forerunner of the Messiah. But for some reason, while in prison, and I guess I can understand if I was in prison, the depression that would come along with that. But he begins to question, is Jesus really the one? Is he really the one? And he sends some of his followers out to Jesus to say, is he the one we're looking for? You remember the answer Jesus gave? Matthew 11, verses 4 through 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear, a message, and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are risen up, and poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus is the one, folks. Jesus is the one of all authority. He has proven that he is the one through his miracles, through his authority, and through this message that he taught, the good news from which we can all be blessed. The Apostle John related and the word of Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So let me encourage you to study this sermon that Christ presented in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to it. Listen to it and be in awed. Be amazed from what we can gain, the blessed life through the Lord's hope, through the Lord's grace, and through his salvation. Take its message, apply it into your heart so that you can receive God's blessing, deity's favor, and you can know you can be in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor and pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you revile and uh, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you have the blessed life today? Do you have God's favor in your life today? 
We adhere to the message of Christ. We adhere to the directives that are given in the Sermon on the Mount. For they are for God's followers, Christ's followers. They are the traits in which we ought to fulfill as his Christians. That we ought to possess. That we ought to live by. Yet the Lord also taught us what we must do to become one of his followers, become a Christian. First, we must recognize that due to our personal sin, we deserve spiritual separation from God. That's what we deserve. Paul wrote the Romans saying that our sins have separated us and what, what we earn because of our sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages, for what we've earned, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Yet Paul also teaches us that God has given us that amazing gift, that, that gift that comes from Jesus. And he's given us his grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Then verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Folks, we not, must recognize what we deserve, but what God offers. Deity has provided salvation from our sins. Jesus Christ, the divine being, willing, willingly came to this earth and lived that, that perfect life. He went to the cross. And he became that perfect sacrifice for us. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Titus chapter 2, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God has done his part. He's done his part in, in such a wonderful and special gift to us, yet receiving his grace is contingent upon my faith and my obedience. Our Lord said that we must develop faith, belief through a diligent study of his message, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Our faith then motivates us to obey Christ, and this obedience is not to merit our salvation, but to accept the grace that he offers us. Therefore, we must confess. We must pledge our, our allegiance of Christ to others. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart one believes unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But we also must repent of our sins change our lifestyle to obeying and honoring Christ for the rest of his lives, the rest of our lives, obeying what he asked us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, so that the time of refreshing you may, come, you may come from the presence of the Lord. Then, folks, we must obey Christ by being baptized, which is when we come in contact with his saving blood. It's when our sins are indeed washed away and we become a child of his. We become a Christian. Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Folks, that's what God's asked us to do. I ask you to examine your life. Have you obeyed what Jesus has asked us? Will you listen to Christ today by becoming a, a Christian and having a blessed life, a favored life by deity? As a child of God, maybe you haven't been living by the directives that God has given. And you, as we study the Sermon on the Mount, maybe you'll see areas where, hey, I need to make this change. Folks, repent. Make sure your heart and life is right with God. But maybe this evening you just need prayers. Maybe you're having difficulties. Maybe there's tough times in your life. And you want the prayers of this congregation. Folks, we're here for you because we love you. We care about you. If there's anything we can do for you this evening, we ask that you consider it.
and you let it be known. As together stand, we together we stand and sing.